It was a mysterious land that glittered in the mist of history. The first light of human civilization appeared there. It was a turbulent place with frequent changes of regime. While China stands in the east of Eurasia, this place stood in the west of Eurasia. They witnessed each other's development over 6,000 years of time. It was called Babylon. It was built on many layers of giant platforms and a temple stood on the top platform. A spiral stairway led to the top of the tower. The tower's base was about 90 meters long and wide, and the tower was about 90 meters high. Over 2,400 years ago, in his masterpiece, Histories, ancient Greek historian Herodotus recorded in detail this man-made miracle which was constructed 4,000 years ago. It was the Tower of Babel, mankind's most spectacular architectural achievement of its time. It stood on the Mesopotamian plain. Mesopotamia is Greek for the land between two rivers, which are the Tigris and the Euphrates. This land gave birth to the earliest known city civilization. In the summer of 2008, the exhibition of West Asia civilization was held in the Louvre Museum. Cultural relics of ancient West Asia, collected by many European museums, were gathered and displayed in the Louvre for the first time. Many paintings displayed at the exhibition were based on the Tower of Babel. We can see from this that the tower had a far-reaching influence on Western artists and even Western societies. There's an important story centered on this tower, which is part of the foundation of Western culture. According to Genesis in the Old Testament, at one time, all men and women spoke the same language, but they flaunted their power and tried to build a tower reaching up to heaven. Their behavior challenged the authority of God. So God confounded their language so that they could no longer communicate with one another. This led to the end of the construction of this tower. Men and women speaking different languages were scattered in different parts of the world. It is a fable that's been passed down for almost 3,000 years. God's rage became the beginning of mankind's misfortune. Cultural differences and conflicts hindered the development of human society. In the Western world, the Tower of Babel is a synonym of re-establishing trust, understanding and communication. At the other end of Eurasia, Xu Bing, a Chinese artist, has been seeking an art proposition about understanding and communication through his works. He is sensitive to human languages, so the idea of a universal language gradually formed in his mind.
。巴比塔这个故事是非常深刻的。人类如果都使用一种语言，人类的力量是巨大的。上帝呢，觉得人类不能够。这么能干，所以呢，就把那巴比伦塔给拆了。实际上，他拆呢是靠什么呢？是靠这个对文字的拆解而达到的。我们设想，如果人类有一种共同的文字，人类就可以做各种各样的事情。呃，呃，我觉得人类的力量就可以变得非常非常的巨大。Chu's creative inspiration originated from his devotion to language and understanding of different cultures. This P O E M S of O F. This can be seen in his book from the sky, which nobody could understand. His introduction to new English calligraphy, which could be understood and copied by Western people. And his book from the ground, which he is still working on, he hopes that different cultures and languages can be linked up perfectly through his continuous artistic creation. In the West Asia Exhibition Hall at the Louvre Museum are many cultural relics and artworks created several thousand years ago. It's hard to imagine that this exhibition hall, with limited space, contains the most resplendent pages of early human civilization. Some say human beings originated in the Garden of Eden. Some believe that the first light of human civilization appeared there. Some say this was a turbulent place with frequent changes of regime. It was Babylon in Mesopotamia, West Asia. Seven thousand years ago, when most people still lived by fishing and hunting, people in this place had already developed a sophisticated irrigation system. They also had a mature calendar four thousand years ago, which divided a year into twelve months, a week into seven days, and an hour into sixty minutes. This is where the first city, school, library, epic, and civic code in human history appeared. Cuneiform script, the earliest writing system in the world, was also born here. L'écriture cunéiforme est le, est le système d'écriture de, de, de la Mésopotamie. Euh, on a donné ce nom de, de cunéiforme, qui, signifie, qui vient du latin, qui signifie cuneus, coin, parce que l'écriture est faite en forme de, de petits coins ou de petits clous, à, à l'ensemble de ce système. The ancient Chinese carved characters on expensive tortoise shells with knives. But the instruments for cuneiform script were clay and reeds, which could be found anywhere in Mesopotamia. Modern scholars believe that the writing systems at the beginning of different human civilizations differed in terms of form and function. Mo 
。当时呢，在商代，人类呢为了寻求庇佑，经常呢会进行占卜活动。那么您可以看到呢，他占卜总共占卜了十一遍。There was a saying in ancient China that the most important things for a country were making sacrifices and military affairs. The oracle bone script was used in sacrificial rites. People carved characters on tortoise shells so they could connect with heaven and earth and seek a mysterious power. Chinese文字其实是上天之造物了，它是神圣之物。过去有这个传统，就是说一张破纸，如果上头要写的字，你都不能拿去随便什么，呃，用的，你都给它收集起来，然后积攒多了以后拿到这个文昌阁，呃，
euh, vers le milieu du, du 19e siècle, euh, les savants et les diplomates français eurent l'idée euh, d'essayer de retrouver euh, les civilisations euh, de la Bible, ou tout au moins citées dans la Bible. Donc. Et les consuls de France, un consul de France euh, d'origine italienne, d'ailleurs d'origine piémontaise, un consul de France à Mossoul, que j'avais nommé, qui s'appelait Paul Emile Botta, en 1842, eut l'idée de faire des fouilles dans le, le nord de ce qui est actuellement l'Irak. In the summer of 1842, the sun roasted the West Asia plain. There was an archaeological breakthrough in West Asia that year. A French consul named Botta and his archaeological team discovered the ruins of a huge palace on a bank of the Tigris River. It was later proved that this royal palace had belonged to Sargon, the famous king of Assyria. Botta became the first modern person to dig at the legendary palace of Assyria. The historical relics excavated by Botta were soon transported to France. In 1847, these treasures were acquired by the Louvre Museum. The French people built the Museum of Assyria, the predecessor of the Louvre's Department of Near Eastern Antiquities. May the blood of our enemy flow through the valley like springs. Let's chop their heads off and pile them up in front of the city wall of our enemy, just as we pile up millet. These words, carved on the monument of an Assyrian king, describe a ruthless period of history. In ancient times, the West Asia plain was a fertile and treasured land, with plenty of water and lush grass and the surrounding tribes risk their lives fighting for it. Un empire fait de, de, de peuples et de très diversifiés, où on parlait plusieurs langues, où il y avait des nomades, des sédentaires, des peuples installés depuis plusieurs millénaires en Mésopotamie, d'autres qui essayaient de, de s'infiltrer par le désert, le désert d'Arabie, le désert syrien, d'autres par les montagnes, les monts du Zagros qui bordent la Mésopotamie. Regime changes occurred frequently, and battles went on and on. Ravished by time, almost all these sculptures of ancient West Asia are incomplete. But their remaining body parts and their glaring eyes seem to reveal some deep concern and fear. According to the records of that time, wealthy and privileged women living in palaces and big houses carefully moisturized their fingers in the morning and at night, even as their country was being conquered. Their fathers and brothers were killed in battle, and they were forced to go to the riverbanks to cut reeds. Their delicate fingers were soon scratched, and they left their blood on the reeds. Those were the marks of their past glory. Sumerians, Akkadians, Hittites, Assyrians, Chaldeans and Persians. Many ethnic groups fought in battle over 4,000 years. Warfare continued on the West Asia plain, plunging the people into misery and suffering. Conquering others became the purpose of their lives, and battles became entertainment for kings. This is the earliest monument in the Louvre Museum's West Asian collection. 
It was dedicated to Naram Sin. This king wore an ox horn shaped helmet, which, according to Sumerian legend, could only be worn by gods. He is marching on the mountain road, trampling the bodies of his enemy underfoot. Behind him, his brave soldiers look up at him in reverence. All kings dreamed of expanding their territory and leaving a good name for posterity. The kings of the West Asia Plain were no exception. They had many monuments built, celebrating their achievements. Three thousand eight hundred years ago, Hammurabi, the king of Babylon, had a stone monument built. What's special about it is that this stone monument pushed West Asian civilization into an unprecedented golden age. Hammurabi était un, un souverain exceptionnel, non seulement par ses conquêtes, c'est en général par les conquêtes militaires qu'on connaît les, les souverains de, de l'Antiquité, mais également parce qu'il était un, un très grand érudit. Il a essayé de faire de, de Babylone, de sa capitale, le centre intellectuel du monde. Et je crois que l'importance de la civilisation babylonienne repose essentiellement sur ce grand souverain This is the most important exhibit in the Louvre Museum's Department of Near Eastern Antiquities. The monument is made of black basalt. The man on the left is Hammurabi, the most famous king of ancient Babylon. The old man sitting on the throne is Shamash, the sun god admired by ancient Babylonians. The sun god is conferring the scepter, which symbolizes the king's power over Hammurabi. This scene could be described with a Chinese saying, which is, the divine right of kings will make the country peaceful and prosperous. Many beautiful cuneiform characters are carved on the lower part of the sculpture. Several thousand years ago, these characters were precise guidelines for ancient Babylon's society and people's lives. This is the famous Code of Hammurabi. Et euh, c'est une, dans, dans l'art mésopotamien, c'est une des euh, très rares représentations euh, d'un souverain euh, qui nous soit conservé entière. There are as many as 3,500 lines of cuneiform characters, including 282 provisions of law, which have a very succinct style. The promotion of the Code of Hammurabi made ancient Babylon the most strictly managed state in the world. See. Un notable crève l'œil d'un autre notable, on lui crèvera un œil. Si une casse la dent d'un autre notable, on lui cassera une dent. C'est le fameux, ce que nous connaissons sous le nom de œil pour œil, dent pour dent, qui est exprimé euh, plusieurs siècles avant euh, dans le code de Hammurabi. Et cette quoi qui peut sembler assez cruelle et barbare était en fait une grande avancée parce que c'était pour essayer de, de mettre plus de, de justice et euh, très certainement pour éviter euh, les règlements de compte personnel qui avaient lieu jusque-là. On essayait de régulariser en quelque sorte euh, les, les châtiments. The Code of Hammurabi provides guidelines for people's behavior. This code, which had been carved onto the black basalt, was the first statute law used to rule the country. If a person 
之子的眼睛，那么也应该弄瞎他的眼睛。一个人打掉别人的牙齿，那也应该打掉他的牙齿。这个牙齿属于他的，你知道吧？哈，啊，就是他打属于他的牙齿，对，是吧？哈，啊。This is an interesting experiment. The rules of the ancient code of Hammurabi come to life on the monitor of the computer. The oldest cuneiform characters are connected with the icons in modern artist Xu Bing's book from the ground. In artistic opinion, anything is possible in the future. On peut trouver effectivement encore des traces de, du code de Hammurabi dans, dans le système français. En fait, à vrai dire, il est encore étudié dans, dans les écoles de droit, à l'université de, de droit. Je crois que les cours commencent par l'étude du, du code de Hammurabi. Je crois que c'est là la très grande importance de cette civilisation babylonienne qui est aux origines de ce que nous appelons, nous occidentaux, appelons la, la culture occidentale. This piece of bronzeware is called the Shi Qi Cauldron, and it was cast a few hundred years before the Common Era. There is an inscription within the cauldron about a general named Bo Maofu handling the case of a deserter according to the law of the time. This inscription is precious material for today's scholars researching the history of ancient Chinese law. But unlike the Western world, the ancient Chinese tended to govern the country with virtues rather than laws. The great sage Confucius once made a comparison between laws and virtues. He wrote, if the people are led by laws and punishments, they will try to avoid the punishment but have no sense of shame. If they are led by virtue, they will have a sense of shame and will become good. Confucius believed that laws could only restrain people from committing crimes, and that this just addressed symptoms but not root causes. To cultivate people's virtue and inclination to goodness was the correct way. Confucianism stressed the cultivation of virtue and self-discipline. It was therefore considered to be the guideline for self-cultivation and national governance by the ancient Chinese. In ancient times, different human civilizations developed in their own way. They advanced side by side without interfering with one another. After Hammurabi passed away, Mesopotamia fell into warfare again. Among the many competitors, the powerful and ruthless Assyrians were triumphant. This country, with its powerful military strength, rose quickly. It imposed suffering and pain on the people living in Mesopotamia and soon fell apart due to the anger of the people. Then, 2,600 years ago, the Kingdom of Babylon rose again. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Neo-Babylonia had a new city built on the ruins of Babylon City. This new city was even more magnificent and splendid. It seemed that the past glory and dreams of Babylon City had returned.
The people of the West Asia Plain headed to the new Babylon city by the light of the sunset. They walked in the main procession street, 18 meters wide and 180 meters long. It was the Avenue of Kings. The high walls along the avenue glimmered in the light of the sunset. Rows of lions were painted on the blue walls, their faces towards Babylon city and their heads upturned. At the end of the street was the Grand Ishtar Gate. Ishtar was a goddess in Babylonian myth. It is said that she was a previous incarnation of Athena from Greek myth. The avenue stretched across the Ishtar Gate and led to the city center. There stood mankind's most spectacular architectural work of the time, the Tower of Babel. Welcome to the center of the world in ancient times, Babylon City. Soon the wealth and power of the new Babylon city reached an extreme and things began to turn for the worse. Extravagance and arrogance started to spread in Babylon. Only 88 years later, led by Cyrus the Great, the rising Persian army conquered Babylon city and Neo-Babylonia collapsed. Later, Xerxes, the king of Persia, was infuriated by the Babylonians' constant revolts. He ordered that the magnificent city of Babylon and the Tower of Babel, symbolizing past glory and dreams, should be burnt down. Around 2,400 years ago, ancient Greek historian Herodotus came to Babylon city. At that time, it was under Persian domination and was not as magnificent as it had been. In spite of this, Herodotus was moved by what he saw. In a book, he wrote that in the world we have known, no city was as spectacular as Babylon. When Neo-Babylonia collapsed, on the other side of Asia, ancient China was also caught in a maelstrom of battles. But unlike the constant battles and regime changes on the West Asia plain, the chaos in China soon came to an end. Ying Zheng, the king of the state of Qin, founded the first united empire in China's history. For the first time in history, carriages all had the same sized wheels. All writing was with the same characters. And there were uniform rules of civic conduct. China had a vast territory. And there were different dialects and customs in different regions. 
With its great military and political power, the Qin Empire made it possible for regional cultures to merge together. Ever since then, Chinese civilization has always stood upright in this part of the world. In the Louvre's Department of Near Eastern Antiquities, the exhibits bear witness to the 6,000-year history of West Asia. The sound of war resounds in the air. People may sigh for the decline of the civilization of Babylon, and at the same time are proud of China's thriving civilization. Nowadays, battles continue on the West Asia plain and it is still in chaos. It seems that in our wanderings, we are entrusted with the mission of seeking certain knowledge. The profound meaning behind the antique fable about the Tower of Babel must be discovered by us. In January 2010, in Iraq, 196 people were killed in violent attacks and 782 were wounded. The West Asia Plain is still thick with the smell of gunpowder. What happened? Never be upset. In February 2010, Xu Bing was still working on his book from the ground. His motive for creation was an exploration of communication and understanding. Since the exhibition of West Asia Civilization in 2008, more and more people have come to visit the Louvre's Department of Near Eastern Antiquities. Many visitors, it seems, come in search of answers. Will this seated clerk unveil mysterious Egyptian secrets? What kind of history and wisdom are hidden behind this renowned museum? Perhaps, from the messages left by the two famous ancient civilizations, we can start to explore their stories about life and death, power and wisdom, the cosmos and eternity.